Finding high-quality mental health care can be daunting and exhausting. That's why Cerebral offers convenient access to online mental health services, including therapy and medication management. Cerebral's diverse clinician team can help with anxiety, depression, insomnia, stress, grief, big life changes, and more. You can schedule and communicate with your care team through Cerebral's mobile app and attend your sessions from the comfort of your own home. Get started with or without insurance. Plus, you can now use FSA or HSA. Start your first month for 50% off at Cerebral.com slash ACAST. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. I'm Jesse Cruikshank, and I've always been told I have a face for podcasting. So I launched a podcast. It's called Phone a Friend because each week I'll break down the biggest stories in pop culture. But when I have questions, I get to phone a friend. I'll phone a royal watcher to find out why Prince Harry is acting like a real housewife. I'll phone a tween to please explain euphoria. And maybe I'll even phone a Backstreet Boy to find out if I still have a chance. I don't? Okay. New episodes drop every Thursday wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. ACAST.com Hello everyone, Kathy here. A quick message before our 200th episode, Aliens vs. Thelma and Louise extravaganza. Um, every month over on the Cinemile High Club, which is our Patreon, we give a big chunk of our income to charity. So far, we've donated to Action for Children, Choose Love, the Trussell Trust, London Irish Centre, Beauty Banks, Crisis, Birmingham and Solihull Women's Aid, Refuge and Stand Up to Racism UK. And for July, we're actually going to give 100% of our Patreon income to Childhood Trust. They're an incredible charity who support vulnerable children living in poverty in London. And they've just launched a really wonderful drive in response to the COVID crisis and the impact it's having on children. Basically, what they're doing is they're match funding 94 brilliant charities that are collectively aiming to raise over three million pounds to support 100,000 children across London. So these 94 projects run by the charities will provide loving care, hot meals, fun activities, recreation, mentoring and many more brilliant activities and opportunities this summer for children who are really in need. So if you sign up to our Patreon before the end of June, 100% of your first month's subscription will go to this wonderful charity. You'll also get access to a huge back catalogue of retro movie watches and a ton of TV reviews too. And there's no obligation to stick around, so you can cancel anytime you want. So basically what you can do is donate to a wonderful charity, get loads of bonus podcast stuff, and then cancel anytime you please. It's basically a win-win. Um, if you want to read more about the Patreon or the charity, head over to patreon.com forward slash the cinema and hope you enjoy the 200 special. Bye. Hi, Dave here. This is my wife, Kathy. Hello. This is the cinema, the podcast where we used to walk home from the movies when the movies were played in uh, giant screens in venues where everyone would sit together in, in the long, long ago. In an old timey space <laughs> called a cinema. <laughs> um, but we've, it's our 200th episode We've done 200 episodes of The Cinema Isle. We've been doing this for f- four years now. Yeah. And, Long uh, time. So w- so thank you to uh, all of you for sticking around and listening to this nonsense. Um, we love doing it. And uh, we had big plans, didn't we? For we had huge plans. Our well, 200 episodes. We hadn't quite put them together, but we had presumed we would do <laughs> We had like, big ideas that we, we had, hadn't executed anything. We had presumed we'd do a live show and we were going to organise it. And then, because we've done a live show before that we really loved... We are going to do a live show with a, with a live screening of a live movie with a live audience. But then since March, we realised that wasn't going to happen. So we didn't bother to organise anything. We scrambled around trying to find an idea for our 200th and we settled on something that we've already done for 150th. <laughs> yeah. So if you remember for 150th or if you're new to the podcast, uh, what we've decided to do is both pick a movie that the other one hasn't seen or that we've been trying to get them to watch for years and they refuse to for whatever reason so it's an opportunity to finally force your spouse to watch the thing you've been trying to get them to watch <laughs> so uh, Dave and I have already watched Thelma and Louise which is the first part of this extravaganza and now and that episode is available in your fees right now so this uh, episode 200 is split into two parts so when you're done here you can go and listen to our Thelma and Louise chat and Dave is making me watch Aliens, which I have no interest in watching. So thank you, Dave. No, and I have had no interest in watching I for... I never had any interest in as watching. As long as I've known you. 
Dave's 15 years. Dave's always like, whenever we sit down to watch a movie, like, I've not tried to make Dave watch uh, Thel- Thelma and Louise that often, but Dave but I, I'm actually always not... tries to make me watch Aliens. That's because I know you'll like Aliens. Like you're always you're, like... you're a huge James Cameron fan. No, You've when... seen, have you seen all his movies except this one? I think I, I think I'm so yeah. Well, maybe not Piranha Two or whatever his. No, I haven't seen Piranha is. Two. But like of the main ones since Terminator, right? You've seen, I think you've seen them all. Probably, I presume you've I have. You seen The Abyss? I have seen The Abyss. Right, yeah. so you you've seen The Abyss, but you haven't seen Aliens. It's just like this is just wrong. It's just, but it's off-putting when. Well, first of all, it's actually off-putting when someone always tries to make you watch something, and secondly, oh, so it's my fault. It's off-putting when it's a franchise. Like when there's lots of. Movies in a franchise. Yeah, but I'm not asking you to watch Alien Resurrection. No, I'm not saying that. Don't encourage you to. I'm, I'm just saying it can be off-putting as opposed to a single movie. And I have seen some of these, like, the later ones of these movies. So yes, what, in fact, we uh, watched Alien Covenant together in the cinema. And the one and did it on this podcast. The one with Michael Fassbender. What was that one? That was it. Oh, Prometheus. Yeah, like that. The, I hated that movie. So like <laughs> yeah, when was, I've seen Prometheus and hated great. it, and then you're telling me I should watch Aliens, <laughs> yeah. it's like eh, there's lots of other movies. Don't out you there. trust me? Don't you like trust my recommendations that I'm telling you you'll like this thing and it's nothing like Prometheus? I mean, I'm presuming it's not like Prometheus or it wouldn't be a classic. You like, uh, you like 80s action movies and you like James Cameron movies. Yeah. It, it is both of those things. I mean, I love Titanic. And you like sci-fi. <laughs> I just, I don't understand and I love your Sigourney resistance Weaver. to this. Well, Dave, resistance is futile. You've won. No, that's the wrong franchise. It only took you 200. <laughs> it only took you 200 episodes to make me watch it. Although maybe so, I should have made you watch Star Trek First Contact, actually. I've seen Star Trek First Contact. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fine. Um, um, so let's go watch it let's do this thing yes I'm, I'm excited I'm excited always excited to watch well, this well now movie. we have to caveat it's the afternoon and we're out walking we're going to watch it in about three hours when our kids are asleep <laughs> yeah uh-huh. fine I you mean nobody have, needed that detail hear, well just in case they're like why are you out and about right before you watch a movie because you're not actually walking to the yeah, cinema yeah doesn't everyone go out for a walk before they watch a movie <laughs> because let's we, sit, all right, let's sit down and watch a movie right well let's go for a 20 minute exactly. walk first um, and the thing is um, about our podcast like it's it's so nice and natural the way we would just normally walk to the cinema record ourselves walk home record ourselves easy peasy now it's like you have to now it's like we walk <laughs> schedule in our you pre-movie <laughs> walk and our after movie walk but we didn't do that for Thelma and Louise I couldn't be asked going for a walk on All a right. Friday night but let's do this let's do this we'll yeah. see you on the other side of Aliens so she could you light up here keep back don't scare Movement! Talk to me, Hudson! Uh, I got signals, I got readings in front and behind. There's nothing back here. Look, I'm telling you, there's something moving and it ain't us. Get them out of there! This time, it's war. Hi, we're back. Kathy has finally watched the movie I've been trying to get her to watch for so many years. <laughs> and I think you liked it. So. Oh, God. I'm glad I watched it because one should always see a classic. Um, so you think it's a classic? No, I know it's a classic. Okay. It's a revered. I mean, it is a classic. Famous movie made by a famous director with a famous actress, and it's deemed a classic. Okay. Um, it's not a classic for me. If I had a DVD shelf anymore, I probably wouldn't sit on my DVD shelf. Okay. But I'm really glad I saw it, and there's like loads of good things to say about it. What I found interesting. There's a giant butt hanging over no, this whole thing. No, it's not a giant butt. <laughs> um, giant butt. It's just huge ass. It's just. Um, <laughs> it's just that. Like, I love Sigourney Weaver, right? So I was so pleased to see her and I think she is unbelievably cool in this movie. Like absolutely like wonderful. Like she's amazing. Um and I really enjoyed like a lot of the characters and a lot of the relationships which we'll talk about. And by the end, like it was so tense and like I found some of the scenes like completely gripping. Sorry, quick note, full spoilers, full spoilers for aliens yeah. in case you haven't full spoilers seen for aliens. it. Like Kathy. So there was like loads going on at the end that I really enjoyed. But there was like 
probably a good 40 minutes where I was like, oh, just get on with it until I got to the action. Like there was so much build up in space of like... You hate build up in space, I hate don't you? build up in space. Do you remember when we watched Arrival and, and, the, the, and they were like, the movie was t- really taking its time and building the atmosphere. And then you just turned to me and said... Oh God, get on with it already <laughs> and just took me I, right out I of it. I don't remember that. But see, I love like lots of character build up and I love lots of plot build up. But when it's just like atmospheric, like here's this spaceship and you're going to watch loads of people prepping to go to space. Like for me, right? So we're in full spoilers. But you want the movie to start with, like, the battle with the alien? No, I don't want... I don't like movies that start with action. No, what I want... The the movie, you're like, offhand, at the very beginning, it's like, oh, hello, Sigourney Weaver, welcome back to Earth. It's been 57 (laughs) years since you last came to Earth. I'm like, that's fascinating! You know, that's, like, the kind of thing we saw in... um, God, what was that movie, that Christopher Nolan movie? Interstellar? Like, there's some really interesting stuff there. And then, okay, grand, it's been 50 years, seven years since I got to Earth. And that's all we hear about it. And I was sitting there going... That is like That's the most existential crisis Somebody could have For 57 years To have been lost from their life And like Everyone they ever loved Missing Now Dave did mention to me As we were watching it Which we'll talk about That there's some Maybe some scenes That made it to a director's cut Yeah cut. so there's But a, what we're watching here though Is the cinematic cut We watched the cut, theatrical cut And it because should have that's what was on Sky Like you don't It's very odd To me To have like that A completely glanced over So that was the kind of thing I was expecting more From from a character perspective Of Ripley Like I feel like I found out so much About Ripley Through her actions And I loved her And I loved how much she um, I, I loved how brave she is And how clever she is And I loved how much She looked after that little girl so I think she's like a wonderful character but I felt like that was a bit of a miss but that being said like the more we like as it went on like it got more and more thrilling um, like I love the, the setup with the kind of baddie corporation guy Burke I thought he yeah, was really played good by Paul he's a nice guy like but you know in the end he's going to probably screw her over but you like <laughs> yeah. him he's a nice guy um, or appears to be a nice guy and then like I just think like I loved Corporal Dwayne Hicks and I was totally shipping them Michael Bean yeah I was totally into them um, do you want an early fun fact? I do want an early fun fact. All right, Can so, you tell me there's a cut where they kiss? Uh, no, unfortunately, Aww. or I don't believe so. Um, but Michael Bean was cast a week into them shooting the movie. Um, the original actor playing um, Hicks was James Remar, who you would know as Dexter's dad from Dexter. Oh, no the way! TV show. Harry! Yeah, Harry. <laughs> um, but he was He's fired. He's in Sex and the City. He is, yes, in Sex and the City. And, and he was fired a week into shooting. Um, Why? Because he was arrested for drug possession. Oh, wow. Uh, apparently. Um, so Michael Bean was, was brought in. Well, there. Michael Bean was brilliant. And so was this, this is before Terminator and before The Abyss? I'll give you I've got the whole production timeline of this right. which I'll run See, you through later See I know later. he's obviously in those movies But sorry well. yes it is, it's after The Terminator and it's before The Abyss Right okay Well anyway I really enjoyed him and then I loved what I loved about Newt as a character was the little girl like, I like that she was really resilient and really clever and I love her relationship with Sigourney Weaver and I love how Sigourney Weaver would like do anything to rescue her at the end and it was so cool but like didn't quite land with me what was that I think there was some maybe some confusing elements where the girl was like clearly not American and trying to do an American accent and that might have been like stumbling her performance but it just felt a bit weird it wasn't like one of those movies where you're like oh that was an amazing kid actor do you know okay. what I mean so I felt like that sometimes threw, drew me out of it a bit um, but yeah overall honestly I really I'm really glad I watched it and like by the end oh my god like that scene in the end when Sigourney Weaver like rescues Newt and then she suddenly realised she's, she's surrounded by all these eggs. Yeah. And then the alien's like, Mom, the mom alien is there. And you know what I was saying today? Mom oh alien. my God, this e- this movie's finally like gripping me. Like, this is a brilliant scene. And then our fucking baby monitor goes off, because it's the next day we're recording this. <laughs> and our Elliot, our baby, who's four months old, starts screaming. So I had In to terror. Go. <laughs> it was that go. scary. And like feed him and settle him, which all took like 20 minutes. And really, that really takes the fun out. By the time you've done all that and you come back down, it's taken attention You'd out of the scene. You'd lost the momentum. <laughs> I had lost the momentum. So that's that is not the movie's fault but also, so the second the mummy showed up you had to become a mummy exactly yeah. uh, so I re- no I really thought that was seen as brilliant and I, l- I found that like the last probably 45 minutes like completely gripping so I I was just that bit kind of that build up bit that didn't quite do it for me okay but I really ind- and like I mean I know James Cameron's an amazing action director like it was funny when um, 
you know that thing that Sigourney Weaver climbs into and she's like driving kind yeah, of a transformer yeah the uh, forklift uh, mech thing yeah. I feel like they ca- they called back to that in Avatar like she definitely gets <laughs> yeah, in to drive something yeah. like exactly like that in Avatar doesn't she Avatar uh, yeah I agree Avatar feels like um, feels like he pulled a lot from his experience from Alien it really does in that um, it's you know like colonial marines it's also um, the uh, his aliens script uh, which James Cameron wrote this as well is um, was inspired partly by the Vietnam War in fact uh, because it's a um, over equipped um, technologically superior army going into a hostile environment which in which their technology is essentially useless oh that's interesting yeah um, I see that and I would argue that the same thing happens in, Ava- in, in Avatar <laughs> really it's kind of the same thing isn't it you know it? what I can't <laughs> all I remember about Avatar is Sigourney Weaver in that thing and like and what thing in that thing she was driving because that's this, all you remember because this I movie reminded Sigourney me of Sigourney Weaver it. drives one of them she definitely movie, does, does. alright um, and I remember like it looking good in 3D that's all I remember I mean Avatar gets maligned for just being a copy of a uh, hundred other things yeah. anyway but, but it's officially though at the time I remember enjoying Avatar but I only saw it once in the cinema but Dave what did you think about Aliens on your 20th rewatch yeah I mean I easily have seen this movie 20 times so the things that stood out to me this time besides just noticing small details like uh, Ripley's wearing Reeboks <laughs> which I'd never noticed before maybe I, and Ripley's actually, wearing Reeboks on the what holiday she wasn't on holiday, <laughs> holiday. what was she on um, well, the, there is a uh, there is a deleted scene which you referenced that I told you about in the um, the special edition which is the director's cut that was released in the 90s which is t- 17 or 18 minutes longer and you get a scene where she is in front of what is a holodeck it's like a screen um, on the ship where she's initially rescued and meets Paul Reiser and it's just before the hearing she's in some screen that looks like a park and then she turns it off so you realise it's just a screen she's not in a park but that's the moment that you were looking for um, where she gets told by Paul Reiser what happened to her daughter so she's been inquiring about her daughter so in the because I haven't seen the first movie I've only seen bits of it in the first movie, do you know? Did you know she had a daughter in the first movie? Oh, good question. I think it's referenced. It's not. It's, it's not, not a major a, plot okay, point yeah. at all. Um, but yeah, you find out that her daughter was had died two years previously at the age of sixty six, and she sees a photo of her, and then she and, and then Sigourney you leave Weaver. That in a movie, like? I know it's a great scene, and I really do think it it adds to um, informs the plot and everything that happens with Newt, and she and Sigourney Weaver delivers a lovely little performance where she kind of breaks down and said, "I told her I'd be home." For her birthday, her eleventh oh, birthday. Stop it! You're gonna make me see. I that for me would have like because I believed her relationship with Newt anyway because it was brilliant. Yeah. But that would have just added an, another layer and also another layer know, to right? her as a person it's, that she's gone through that loss and then she's still willing to go back and be this kick ass. Exactly. It's it's it's, it's, it's absolutely cracking scene. And there's just this moment where which is the thing you were looking for where she's looking at a photo of a 66 year old woman and touches Aww. it and sees her daughter and that, that's can you imagine that? I can't like I actually can't imagine that um, and we kind of saw and yeah you referenced Interstellar which you get a little bit of that as well which is done well but so for me um, the things that stood out to me this time rewatching it were I think it's the first time I've watched it in, in HD funnily enough I don't think I've seen it since the DVD wow. and it looks great it the looks movie, awesome. the visual effects of this movie which it won an Oscar for deservedly are incredible and this is 1980 I guess 5 when they're, when they're making this and it's all it's almost all correct me if I'm wrong um, people who are more knowledgeable than me but it's like it's, this is 99% practical effects so the like, aliens of course are, it is like James Cameron like built the Titanic when he made Titanic like, <laughs> yeah. like fair play to him like he really goes there when he's making a movie he, he goes for like, it he and does he just dives to like discover the real Titanic before he films the movie and it was yeah so he's he's committed to bringing creating stuff and bringing stuff to life which you know with the work of Stan Winston who's a very famous and his team a very famous uh, practical effects dude so for instance like the all the alien Costumes are all the aliens are played by people in. I thought costumes. you were going to say they're played by aliens. They're played by real aliens. Um, they're real alien eggs. None were damaged <laughs> in the filming. Um, and they and they hired uh, gymnasts and dancers uh, because they wanted them to move like. Um, interestingly, <laughs> I um, want to move like an alien. I want to move <laughs> like an alien. Are you done? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, 
and 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 the, the all the um all the equipment's real like the guns were made the guns are real guns that were uh, sci-fi looking and they just oh, sort the of guns made me laugh when they're real like they, the, they actually the, were firing I've forgotten her name but like a small woman soldier Vasquez Vasquez is like walking like groin first with her gun <laughs> so I big I love the she walks with that giant uh, <laughs> but here's she's an, like crotch out I'm just going to weave in loads of facts now while we're talking yeah so. for anyone who doesn't know on our retro movie reviews we do on Patreon it's always the responsibility of somebody to do fun facts and Dave's doing the fun facts today. Yeah, I've, so I've, I've been swatting up on so aliens. hit me up on these fun facts. So, um, well, no, I'd like to finish... A little, a little, let's get to that in a minute. But my uh, my additional thoughts on, on this rewatch were, yeah, it looks great. The visual effects are just amazing. Like, he, there's never a moment... There's, besides a couple of dodgy effects, I would argue, like when the helicopter crashes, takes you out a little bit. Or what about when an but, alien somehow knows how to operate an elevator? Yeah, let's not. Well, let's not worry about that. But you don't see that. No, I think the movie. I wish we'd seen its tentacles pressing on the buttons. <laughs> that would be funny. And I think that's to James Cameron's strength as a as a director. He knows how much of each of these things to show because you show too much and it's and it's a, a giant up. puppet or it's a person yeah. in a suit. Uh, and the and Ridley Scott did the same on Alien. It's and it's also that creates um, more of a sense of threat. Like the aliens are never scarier. When they're in an air vent over their head and you can't see them, you know, and yeah. it's and when you and I think to I disagree with your point on like the build up taking too long because I think that creates the suspense. It's the thought of the aliens and seeing what they've done before ever seeing them is the thing that instills the dread in me. But maybe the problem for me then is because I've already seen and this is not how you should be watching a franchise. I've already seen latter ones, so. It's like the, all the build-up of kind of showing you what the aliens have done, but like I know that because I've seen other movies. Yeah, in it. Okay. So that that is. A I problem guess the difference is I it. was getting in. I'm in the moment, and I'm allowing the to be caught up in the atmosphere that's being created. And yeah. you're you're more you just want the plot to kick in. Yeah. Yeah, which is fair. That's we that's we we look for different things sometimes in movies. Um, and the other thing that really stood out to me was uh, you kind of referenced this Sigourney Weaver's performance in this is just like incredible. Like a lot a lot gets. Um, bandied about about her being an incredible action heroine and she is and Ripley is in, in, in one of those all time great characters She's unreal I'm obsessed action, with her he- now. action heroes I want to have a Ripley poster like on my window no but, not on my window but I on think my what, wall what, um, well, well there's so there's good speaking of posters like the poster image um, of this movie is Ellen Ripley standing cradling Newt in one arm and like a gun and a flamethrower in the other like I mean that's an insane image this sort of mix of action hero and maternal figure yeah, it's it's, awesome. it's absolutely incredible and there's so many striking like like um, p- things that could become posters in this movie when Newt's in the water and the alien comes out of the water behind yeah, her yeah that was awesome it's an, it's, it's, it's an incredible sight I'm watching Sigourney Weaver like as we were watching the movie and like she's so brilliant I did say to Dave, like, if if this was just a male character, I wouldn't be. I'd be half as interested in this movie. Yeah. Like, it, it's so even. Like, I know this movie's quite old now, but even now, it's really unusual to have a female lead well, in an it, action movie. It really is. And on that, I think it's interesting. It, it, this actually makes for an interesting double bill with Thelma and Louise it in really many ways. does yeah they, these amazing actresses like in these amazing roles that you just don't really see that much of and you know we go to our episode to, to hear more on our thoughts on that but the, you know that movie is clearly a, a feminist statement and in many ways I think all the alien movies could be looked at as that because in and Ridley in the, Scott obviously made the first alien and Thelma and Louise which we yes, talked yeah, about yeah of course episode. of course yeah. um, so in the first alien and this um uh, Ripley's character is being told by men that she's wrong and, and at every point she's butting up against people who are telling her she's wrong or she doesn't know what she's talking about in the scene with the conference uh, the conference with the, the business people at the beginning they don't believe her don't worry about it um, I love with- even when they're in space and she's like like this thing's horrible and Burke's like yeah but I'm just going to take some samples don't worry about it yeah, I'll be fine exactly. like what did Burke think <laughs> would happen he thought that the alien would go inside her and Newt and then they'd, he'd immediately freeze them or whatever what did like I love that Burke had no plan he was just really after some money his and he plan- wanted to pay oh, yeah, it's just thing. money it's yeah. just dollar signs yeah. and look and to be fair that would that's an incredibly valuable but you're right it's because he didn't weapon. believe her and I feel like if it had been like an army commander telling him no no this is what's going to go down he would have listened yeah they don't they don't believe her but what Sigourney Weaver does best which she doesn't get as much credit for yeah the action stuff she's obviously awesome at is the vulnerability and the fear 
that Sigourney Weaver gives to um, Ellen Ripley for the first half of this movie yeah, she's petrified she is crippled by fear and anxiety we see her waking up drenched, drenched in, in, in sweat having these nightmares and she tells Burke the first time I'm not going I'm not going back there like, this isn't someone who's instantly courageous this isn't uh, John Matrix from Commando who's just so two dimensional <laughs> it's just like I do it for Jenny do you know it's like this is <laughs> I do it for you. <laughs> it's like she's a reluctant hero, like the best action heroes, John McClane, etc. Um, and um, she sells that fear so well. And even up to the point where the Marines are in charge for the first half of this movie. And she's a consultant and is playing that consultant. They're not listening to her. She's not really fighting the case. She's just watching it all happen. And is and doesn't. Re- she's reluctant, doesn't want to do any of it until... Uh, she has to because they all fail and yeah. she is so, and then instantly she kicks into that overdrive she is capable and determined and resourceful and so smart and and the difference is all the technology and all these people's training um is not suitable to the situation they're in and when it fails they can't adapt and they panic you yeah. know game over man. they just start like and now there's a really annoying scene where their boss says like don't shoot here and and he doesn't want them to shoot because it's like they're in this room where everything will blow up if they shoot yeah. but he doesn't explain that so he just says don't shoot and he then says they take talk, the clips away from everybody they all with just no start context. shooting anyway but it's yeah. like that but they're trained to shoot like you know they they see no other way of fighting this thing yeah I love when there's a bit where Sigourney Weaver like kind of sizes up the big mommy scary alien and takes a flamethrower and just shows her what she could do to one of the eggs Yeah, and it's like this woman to woman scene of like I see you I love that I thought that was amazing but that's another example of uh, Ripley's resourcefulness because she recognises this creature is intelligent and is a mother and I'm in its nest and that's the best smartest way to get out of that situation oh my god it's the absolute smartest way to do it but then I love that she's gotten away she's kind of on the corner of it and then is like Oh, fuck it. Yeah, it no, burns all the eggs. Yeah. No, she does it. Fair <laughs> enough. She was just being smart in the moment. And the but- other thing, the other thing that's good about this movie is, and this has been talked about a hundred times, but it is a sequel that is the equal of its original, which is rare, um, and is kind of, and, and is different, and almost just shifts genre slightly, and also progresses things and moves it along, rather than kind of just doing the same thing again, that well, like a lot of horror movies would do. I it was quite interesting that, um, like I'd never seen the first one and it didn't matter at all which I liked like Dave said to me it won't matter that you've not seen the first one and I no, find you it get everything you need in the first five minutes except the daughter stuff which we know would have made it better and then w- with James Cameron I know he was like you know he wasn't James Cameron like he is now he was a relatively like newer then but I think it's amazing that like someone like James Cameron would have taken on a sequel and clearly he did it because he loved the world and he knew he could bring it forward like it's unusual for someone of that caliber to take on a second movie in a franchise excepting like modern day like MCU now where it's quite common it, it is more unusual to do that well do you want the top line story of how that all happened I want as much fun facts as you can hit me with I've got, well I've got fun facts <laughs> but this, this bit's and not necessarily got, fun but I it's mean, interesting let's be real most of our facts are never fun <laughs> no I've got some actual fun okay stuff. All right. hit me with a stream of facts alright so it's 1979 Alien has come out right. and the um writer co-writer producer and founder of the studio Brandywine Productions that made it David Geiler uh, is very keen to make a sequel with Fox and they're keen immediately to capitalise on it of course um, however all this interesting stuff happens in the background so the, the president of Fox um, is, is, is leaves um he, the guy who was keen and is replaced by new management who aren't as interested in an alien what? sequel but surely the first don't one want made to do it. money it did make mo- mo- a lot of money but they're new uh, they think it's too expensive and they're not interested and then also David Geiler um, sues Fox because they weren't giving him enough profits or the disbursement of profits from Alien uh, wasn't fairly distributed and that case wasn't settled until 1983 so wow. that's why there was seven years between these movies so then it's probably a good thing it was seven years though because it meant people were kind of waiting for it yeah true um, and by it's then like when we saw Avengers Endgame and then two months later saw Spider-Man yeah there was like, no appetite was for more like I, I completely a, agree like, such a killer um and by then, so it's 1983 now, the case has been settled and there's new Fox executives again because there's a lot of shifting of happening course. around Fox in the 80s. Plenty of executives and around there. These guys are keen to make Alien and they sign up with David Geiler 
And here we go, they're good to go. Now they start looking for a writer in 1983. And what do they come across but James Cameron's screenplay book. for The Terminator. Not made at this time. And uh, Guyler loves it and he approaches Cameron. God, imagine reading The Terminator script for the first time and like... And being that person who saw it and... Sorry. We have to get out of the way, there's bikes coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, no worries. No worries. Um, what a thrill you would get. Imagine being the... You know the way people send in scripts and someone discovers them and oh, like, says we need cracking. to decide like, oh my God. So I just love that movie. He sees the script. It's already in pre-production um, and Cameron and Guyler meet. They get on and then Cameron... Does. James Cameron's like, listen, I'll fly to space. He's I'll become an astronaut, <laughs> and tell you time I make your movie. He, um, he, very good. He's a, uh, he's keen to, he's keen to get involved. So while he's making the Terminator, he goes away, spends three days on a first initial uh, treatment, and gives it to to Guyler and Fox. They don't really like it. Uh, so are they like nothing happens in the first hour, Jimmy? A, a lot of the Fox execs didn't like. I don't know the details. Um. But then the Terminator gets delayed by nine months because of a scheduling conflict with Arnold Schwarzenegger filming Conan the Destroyer. I was going to say, what's he filming? He's <laughs> yeah, 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 in yeah. New York. Kurt, Conan, no, no, that was uh, the late 70s. Um, so Cameron's got nine months on his hand and then he writes another treatment. Uh, it's only 90 pages at this stage, but the president of Fox is so impressed with it that he tells Cameron, this movie's yours and you can direct it if the Terminator is successful now naturally the Terminator is massively successful so James Cameron and his wife at the time producer Gail Ann Hurd who does the Terminator both sign on to make Aliens now they talk to he marries very impressive women doesn't he he does Linda Hamilton um, later on um, now the, um, is he married to Catherine Bigelow Did I, I completely make that up? believe so yeah um, now Sigourney Weaver isn't really keen to sign on but then she meets James Cameron and he convinces her. But Fox don't want to uh, work with her because they're having uh, contract disputes. And they ask the Cameron... fun fact ever. They ask Cameron to write her out of the story. Get rid of Ripley. You can't write Ripley he, out of the I know, story. Right? And, well, he says the same. Him and uh, Gail Ann Hurd re- flat out refuse. And they say, we're not budging. And, to, and, and this is what I kind of like about James Cameron. I think as difficult as he is apparently to work with, He's, He's very committed a and and is uh, yeah and and doesn't like roll over. Um, so they eventually submit, um, and she gets a million dollars to do Aliens plus a percentage of the profit. Now, for context, she was paid thirty five thousand dollars to do Aliens. Wow! So this is a huge and and that only increases from here. It goes to three million and eight million for the sequels. Um, so it's all well, systems go. I hope go. so. She carries the movie. Now Cameron said his approach for writing Aliens was to focus more on terror and less on horror. Um, and he, as I've already, I've already mentioned, he drew inspiration from the Vietnam War. Um, and this was also reflected and imbued into the attitude of the colonial marines to represent the uh, US Army in Vietnam. Cocky, confident of their victory, and then ultimately panicking when they are completely outmatched okay. in foreign soil um, now here's an interesting one Cameron listed as an inspiration for the colonial marines Robert A. Heinlein's novel Starship Troopers <laughs> Starship <laughs> Troopers we have reviewed on our Patreon <laughs> yes, and we had lots of fun watching that, that. Um, which I think it sounds to me like Cameron kind of um, missed the sort of gung-ho uh, Jingoistic Reagan era sort of attitudes of that, or 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 he is aligned to that, and you know, whereas Starship Troopers, the movie, totally, uh, takes the piss totally out of it. look looks at it from a left point of view and it's, it satirizes it, but he pretty much takes it and imbues it for all its sort of uh, right wing value. Um, and the actors who played the Marines were asked to read the novel, and they underwent military training for two weeks everyone and, and with each other to form bonds I can see why they were asked to do the military training why were they asked to read Starship Troopers <laughs> did, that's sorry. what James Cameron like wanted them to read not good background like work <laughs> now, um, I mentioned James Remar originally being cast to play Hicks and he na- and he naturally did the two weeks military training with them which means Michael Bean didn't mm-hmm. also uh, Sigourney Weaver Paul Reiser didn't do any training with them deliberately because they wanted well, them to be unit. treated as outsiders but also Paul Reiser doesn't do anything he locks himself in a room <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um, but James he Remar he the easiest job in this whole movie like he was just an office but he's, guy, he's office very space. good in this oh he's brilliant he's, but like um, from an acting perspective he had like the sweetest deal 
yeah, he doesn't. It's not a very physical or demanding yeah. role for him. But but it's like he. You're right. He needs to. He's charming while also being um, sinister. Because even by the end, I was like, I still get why he was doing it. Like if if it, if it could have worked, it would have made sense. Like what he was doing. And also, it's like, but no, it's not easy to make a character kind of likable and hateable yeah. at the same time. I think Paul Reiser is great in this. But James Remar as Hicks is in the film um, because they, the week they shot. Um, was the sequence where they first entered the alien hive and those sequences were too expensive to reshoot. So when you're looking at the back of Hicks entering that, it's James Remar, not Michael Bean. That is a fun fact. Um, and now Newt... But why did they take him... So he was arrested for drug possession. Does that, why does that mean he couldn't work in the movie? As in, was he, he in was prison? Fired. He was fired from, by the studio. It's like a morality It's probably a bad look. Right, OK. Yeah. Uh, drugs are bad. This is 80s Regan, uh, Nancy Regan war on drugs. OK, yeah. Um... No, it's actually New- lousy because I mean I'm not casting aspersions on these actors but like it's the 80s in Hollywood everyone would have been doing drugs yeah but this is the, this is the hypocrisy of the world yeah uh, everyone was doing drugs probably everyone in this movie and all the executives that made the decision to fire him yeah but he was caught and it's public so it's gone um, so Newt was apparently the hardest role to cast because they interviewed loads of child actors but um, James Cameron said that they were all um they'd done too many commercials and they were all like actors in the mix already so they couldn't help but like doing a big smile at the end of all their lines <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they cast um, Carrie Hen who played Newt because she'd never acted before and she never acted again um, well, she didn't have an interest in pursuing a career in acting and she became a teacher well, she was, oh that's sweet she's probably yeah. traumatised by the experience of this movie like I was actually thinking as much as they were all prosthetics and I'm sure she was in a safe like environment like it would have been very scary for a kid just the set I don't know yeah prob- probably but I mean so where is she from then what was it, with her accent but I guess when you see all those like the face hugger was just a puppet with like loads of people pulling wires I guess yeah so I guess if you see all that and there's 14 people around it then it kind of takes the the air of atmosphere away from it yeah. and I'm sure they did everything they could to not scare the shit out of the poor child <laughs> where is she from uh, I don't know uh, sorry um, I didn't I didn't pick that up for you <laughs> it's okay but you can frantically google it that's fine right, I'm want. not bothered um all right, so there's an it, there's interesting stories about the behind the scenes clashes that happened on this movie because James Cameron is kind of famous for uh, rubbing people up the wrong way on set and being a very um, dogmatic and um, uh, top like militaristic sort of director. It's his vision and it's his highway, and he also works people to the bone by all accounts. So they shot this in Pinewood Studios over 10 months in England but the um, the film crews that he was working with were, the British film crews were heavily unionised and weren't really up for the 14 hour days that James <laughs> I mean, Cameron wanted them? everyone to work so they didn't get on and apparently a lot of them had worked on Alien where it was also where that was also shot with Ridley Scott a British director who oh, I guess treated so them a lot different. more fair, yeah. fairly and also um, they didn't see Cameron as um they didn't respect him because Ridley Scott's in his 40s at this stage a lot more accomplished James Cameron's only 31 oh my god when he made stop this. it are you I know, kidding it's disgusting um, he's 31 has no film under his belt uh, the Terminator's just barely been released at this stage um, so they're probably like who's this young schmuck yeah they and did, he's they, only directing the sequel exactly they, they, they weren't really on board with it um and apparently they mocked uh, they were mocking producer Gail Ann Hurd for being his wife and saying that's the only reason she has the job oh it was, that's horrible it was pretty it was pretty nasty on set so it's kind of like seems like both sides were kind of at fault he's asking them to work 14 hour days and crazy schedules yeah. and they weren't giving either of them any respect so it wasn't an easy um, film set and um, he also clashed with his director of photography Dick Bush because uh, Dick Sorry, Bush Sorry, what's his name? Repeat the name Dick Bush Okay, just checking Yeah, okay Long pause for, yeah. for laughter there um, He said <laughs> He said that Look on your face I wish everyone could see it um, He said that the schedule was ridiculous and that can't be met and he kept insisting on the lighting in the alien nest being much brighter because uh, it wasn't coming across well Cameron wanted dark foreboding nest lit only by the lights from the Marines armour and um, and it doesn't work out for, for Bush, so he gets fired. Uh, Cameron, <laughs> Cameron, oh, Cameron gets him fired. Uh, and then when he gets fired, the whole crew walks out. So the whole production <laughs> stops when this, See, this director is why you need of photography... union men. They'll get behind each other. <laughs> so they all get behind each other and they walk out. Uh, and there's there's massive dispute happens. And Gaylan Hurd 
to her credit, manages to convince the whole crew to come back. And a man called Adrian Bibble is hired to replace Bush. And we're back on track. But there was another person who wasn't happy with the production of Aliens. And it was the composer, very famous composer, James Horner, who was told he would have six weeks to write the score, see the movie in England. So he flies into England. There's no movie. There's nothing ready. Uh, he has to wait three weeks to get a cut of the movie, in which, it, during which time he's just wandering around set aimlessly and is very frustrated with James Cameron. Uh, so for his point of view, not a happy camper, uh, very rushed. I think he did an amazing... Pr- um, Produced an amazing score. Uh, you know picked what? up I can't the work of the Jerry Goldsmith. We only watched it last night. Uh, that's not necessarily, it's not necessarily memorable, but it's effective. Whether you notice it or not, it's, it's helping to create that sense of terror and dread. Um, and it was Oscar nominated. Um, he, he also complained, this is interesting, that the studio he was given was too outdated uh, and, he was, and the studio was Abbey Road. <laughs> <laughs> so James Horner huh? it's the 80s right so he wants to plug in synthesizers electronic of equipment course. everyone needs synthesizers synthwave baby uh, Ab- all, all Abbey Road and the London Philharmonic who he was working with were not equipped for uh, for what he needed uh, and he had such a bad time working. surely he at least took a photo of himself on the zebra crossing <laughs> any <laughs> sure, self-respecting person um, he had such a bad time making this that he thought he'd never work with James Cameron again but then James Cameron comes knocking in 1997 so impressed with James Horner's score for Braveheart that he says I, I want you to work on my new movie Titanic don't tell me he wrote My Heart Will Go On I think Celine Dion wrote that really? I, I, well he did the score James Horner did but the score, the score I don't okay, have Titanic speaking, fun facts to speaking hand speaking as someone who in 1997 bought the Titanic soundtrack every song on the soundtrack is effectively My Heart Will Go On like that's the overarching score of the movie maybe he did write it so he maybe didn't write the lyrics but he would have written that beautiful music guys tweet us the answer (laughs) at the cinema Um, I mean also at that point see the the, the funny thing about James Cameron like when he wasn't famous and, and didn't have those hits behind his belt he's just an asshole when he is famous and has the hits behind his belt he's a visionary and that's what all, why these <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. men get to be so successful and get to continue being assholes to people is because their success gives them power yeah I'm not, no arguments here um, it's like it, he is successful he's undeniably exactly. successful and then that only emboldens him um, the movie was nominated for seven Oscars including which I'd only found out today best, best actress. supporting actress for Newt no I'm afraid not uh, best actress Sigourney Weaver she was nominated and it was seen as a landmark nomination at the time because sci-fi and fantasy films still largely overlooked by, like by the Oscars like basically sci-fi fantasy romantic um, action comedy like none of those genres get nominated like only drama gets nominated it's really weird yeah. so I'm, I'm I mean I think it's an Oscar worthy performance I'm just amazed it got nominated and, uh, and the Oscar did go to Marley Matlin for her performance in Children of a Lesser God which I had to look up and is a, is a drama alright oh, um, I've not seen that one uh, me neither uh, Empire Magazine named this the greatest film sequel of all time Entertainment Weekly declared it the second best action film of all time behind Die Hard and oh yeah? interesting and interestingly it was almost universally praised in 1986 when it came out it was even featured on uh, the cover of Time magazine and was declared the summer's scariest movie but famous American critics um, Siskel and Ebert disagreed on it so Roger Ebert said it was a painfully and unremittingly intense um, film and a superb example of filmmaking craft when I walked out of the theatre there were knots in my stomach from the film's roller coaster ride of violence whereas Gene Siskel said Alien is one extremely violent protracted attack on the senses towards the end the film resorts to placing a young girl in jeopardy in a pathetic attempt (gasps) to pander to who knows what audience interesting read some people have praised the technical excellence of Aliens well the Eiffel Tower is technically impressive but I wouldn't want to watch it fall apart on people for two hours Ooh, I, <laughs> I love, love that. that line it's that's the kind of review we need to be doing it's actually a great review um, and I'll give you the actual fun facts now thank you for Wait, humoring that's not, me we've more, fun, we've more facts no these are actually fun okay. I actually categorized them well, you better uh, hurry into up, fun you boiling yeah, up yeah this is, <laughs> it is hot. hot okay um and we're pushing a ba- sleeping baby around in a Okay, there's only a few So of he's these. covered under shade. We're not covered. So the atmosphere processor set, so that's where the queen alien is, 
uh, was not dismantled after filming and then it was later reused in 1989 as the Axis Chemicals set for the movie Batman. That's where Jack Nicholson falls into the tub of acid and becomes the Joker. So that sat there for four years unused? Uh, yeah, apparently. Well, pr- probably two or three years. Um, or maybe it was used. Maybe it was used as an actual chemical facility. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ellen, uh, sorry, uh, Sigourney Weaver is not a fan of guns, and she was lobbying James Cameron the entire time to let Ripley go the entire film without using. I a was. Gun. Th- do you know what's funny? We were, were actually talking about it as we were watching the movie, and like, you know, like gun violence is so terrible, and like, I hate how prolific it is in movies. And we were actually saying that like it felt like there was way too many guns in this movie when we were watching it. Like it was distasteful. So I'm pleased to hear she tried her best. Well, that's kind of what the, what the the point with the Starship Troopers thing. I think James Cameron. Um, feels like it, it this feels like a very sort of right wing conservative attitude towards this kind of stuff i don't feel like it's got ever it doesn't have an anti war message as such no, i, I because mean they're, she they're still ineffective. wins the day with like flamethrowers and yeah stuff. exactly yeah. um now she eventually she naturally lost the argument or was eventually convinced um james cameron convinced her by taking her to a shooting range he says this on the Jesus. dvd commentary and showing her how fun it could be to shoot a gun <laughs> And then he says on the DVD <laughs> commentary, he says, another liberal bites the dust oh <laughs> in God, reference to this. Do you know what? I didn't really know anything about James Cameron before we started recording this podcast and you've made me intensely I know, he like sounds him. like a horrible dick. Was that, like, was that your like, intention? Uh, no, but that's oh. uh, what you're getting from it. Um, the forklift exoskeleton took three months to build. It couldn't stand on its own and it needed wires or a pole attached through the back. It's ridiculous. And when Sigourney Weaver was in it, uh, for it to move a stuntman had to hide behind her moving the arms and legs it's ridiculous <laughs> but that like but one vaguely unnecessary it's thing. very convincing though um, the uh, life size alright this is the last one I'll leave you with this one so the life size alien queen this is awesome was an actual life size giant puppet so to speak um, that was 14 feet tall was operated by 18 puppeteers two inside it 16 outside it had control rods they hydraulics they 14 hours a day cables probably and it had a crane above it holding it up like it's an insane <laughs> piece of work it's like sometimes like you wouldn't mind a bit of CGI like that seems like a lot of work which they didn't have it at the time <laughs> in guess, fact yeah. um, well James Cameron also working with Industrial Light and Magic pioneered uh, CGI or they you know they pioneered CGI for his movies The Abyss and then Terminator 2 okay um, so these were some of the earliest examples so so I would say he's always been at the forefront of visual effects along with George Lucas and the likes and did you say that when we were watching it that the actress playing Vasquez had been like browned up to play Latina character yes okay so yes um, the actor oh, I don't have her, hand, uh, her name to hand but in, um, interestingly, I only found this out a couple of years ago. She's the same actress that plays John Connor's mom, or stepmom, in Terminator 2, uh, oh. who gets taken over by the um, T-1000. Do you remember the, uh, yeah. the the arm going through the milk? Yeah. Uh, Wolfie's just fine, honey. <laughs> um, so she's very white then. She's very Caucasian, yeah. not at all Hispanic. Um, so for whatever reason, she was cast to play Vasquez, and then they... They basically put brown face on her, which God. is not cool. Um, it's weird, and, and it's not the actress's fault. It's like it's a weird thing, like from a filmmaker's no, no, perspective. Give the role to someone of of that like of that color. Why would you? Yeah, I know. Put brown makeup on someone. Don't get it. Um, weird and completely unnecessary. Completely. Like, like, unnecessary. I don't feel like that. They had to have that. Like, why would they think they had to have that actress in the role? Anyway, the. Um, that's it, that's it. Uh, we'll, leave, we'll leave it there, will we? We will leave it there. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, I'm really glad I watched it because it felt like it's a movie I should have seen. So thank you, Dave. Um, thank you. And I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. I had it. fun watching it with you. Um, I really enjoyed your very protected facts on the production. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. No, I actually, just love this movie. I, I genuinely really enjoy them. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Get in touch with us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Cinemile, cinemile at gmail.com. We would love you could head over to iTunes and drop us an old review. We would yes. really appreciate it. And um, a quick shout out to some of the amazing listeners um, like Simon Smith. Jason, Jack, Tamara, Elisawi, and Liz M, who have recently joined our Patreon page and are 
contributing to our show at two or three dollars a month and if you sign up to patreon.com forward slash the cinemile you get access to our bonus podcast feed the cinemile high club which has a load of retro movie reviews loads of tv reviews uh we just did looper and a league of their own um We've done some James Cameron movies. We've done True Lies. Oh, I forgot we did that. That yeah, was awesome. There's loads. Of, so if yeah. you want more old movie reviews like this, and uh, how head we do the there. movies is that um, our, our subscribers suggest a theme. Like for example, somebody suggested mistaken identity movies. Then we get everyone to suggest what mistaken identity movie they think we should watch then we do a poll and that's how we ended up watching True Lies so it's all picked by the listeners and it's loads of fun um, so thank you everyone and hope you're enjoying the sunshine I'm not yes and don't forget Thelma and Louise also available right now and uh, we will be back very soon for our 201st <laughs> we'll be back episode. as soon as we can when a new movie comes out well we think there's a couple of new movies after coming out on uh, the streaming services right, so, so we'll, we'll probably do one of them okay bye bye That's great. That's just fucking great, man. Now what the fuck are we supposed to do? We're some real pretty shit now, man. You finished. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. What the fuck are we going to do now? What are we going to do? ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. I'm Jesse Cruikshank, and I've always been told I have a face for podcasting. So I launched a podcast. It's called Phone a Friend because each week I'll break down the biggest stories in pop culture. But when I have questions, I get to phone a friend. I'll phone a royal watcher to find out why Prince Harry is acting like a real housewife. I'll phone a tween to please explain euphoria. And maybe I'll even phone a Backstreet Boy to find out if I still have a chance. I don't? Okay. New episodes drop every Thursday wherever you get your podcasts. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com.